It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me today are the Conservative MP Tom Hunt, the Liberal Democrat MP Manira Wilson, Sasha O'Sullivan from City AM and Jack Blanchard of Politico. This evening, the first flight taking asylum seekers to Rwanda is scheduled to leave, but how many people will be on board? If people aren't on the flight today, they will be on subsequent flights to Rwanda. Jesus makes it very clear, reiterating in the Old Testament, you do not punish the innocent in order to catch the guilty. Nicola Sturgeon launches a fresh campaign for Scottish independence. I was re-elected as First Minister just over one year ago on a clear commitment to give the people of Scotland the choice of becoming an independent country. Should free school dinners be extended to help up to a million more children whose families receive universal credit? Also, is such a popular resort 12 months of the year uh, and that's put tremendous pressure on, on the price of housing which means that many local people have been priced out. Whitby has become the latest tourist hotspot to vote for a limit on the sale of second homes. Let's start with this headline in The Guardian and the news that the co-founder of Just Eat made UK's new cost of living business czar. David Buttress, former CEO of Takeaway Delivery App to assist in developing schemes that help people struggling with rising prices. So my opening question to the panel and our guests is do SARS make a difference? I think they can do, and I think there's been occasions where they have made a difference and occasions where they haven't made a difference. I think it depends on how good the czar is. Uh, but obviously this is a critical issue, and I think that you know, if, if this particular individual is able to come up with some solutions that can, can help the situation for millions of people up and down the country, then, then that, that's a good thing. Manira? Uh, the government's track record on czars shows that it brings in experts like Sir Kevin Collins to give advice on education, catch up and, and helping our children recover from the COVID pandemic totally ignored his advice and he quit. They brought in Henry Dimbleby to look at a food strategy and they scrapped a lot of what he had to say. So, you know, by all means, bring czars on board. But if you're not going to listen um, and you're just going to come out with, you know, headline by press release, uh, I mean, policy by press release, rather, then uh, I would question the value. I, I don't think it's fair to say that the government haven't um, listened to the various R's they've had over the last few years. Um, but can, you name, can you name one they have? Kevin um, Collins. I think, there's, the I think there's, there's, be, there's, there's been... We couldn't meet what he was asking for in terms, of, in terms of a financial commitment. But at the end of the day, it's his job to come up with, as an expert, what he believes in an ideal world would be done. It is only the government's job to balance what he's asking for, or, or, or whoever is leading that report, with what is affordable and what, and what we can do compared to all the other priorities that the government faces. It's an unpaid role, Manira. Do you think it's a worthwhile ambition to have people focus on a specific um, sort of plan to deal with something like the cost of living or education recovery? Your point is absolutely made um, that the government didn't take up all the recommendations in terms of the spend. But is it a good idea to have someone focus on it? I, I personally think it, it's a good thing for government to have, bring in external expertise. But my point stands, if you're going to then just mm. promptly ignore a lot of those recommendations, I would ask, what's the point? And let's actually focus on coming up with policies and solutions that uh, struggling families need right now, like a VAT cut, which uh, the Liberal Democrats have been pressing for. Uh, this is David Buttress, the man who's been tasked with finding um, some sort of way of easing the cost of living burden. Sasha, is a multimillionaire venture capitalist the best person to advise the government on cost of living? Well, I think that actually having someone who's had experience with business, we saw Kate Bingham work very successfully having had a venture capital background with the vaccine task force because I think actually having that experience enables you to understand the risks and rewards better and look at individual policies. I do think it's a worthwhile thing to have someone looking at the cost of living crisis because otherwise we get dragged down in individual decisions without actually understanding the individual repercussions. And having someone who's worked with Just Eat can understand the position that a lot of the suppliers and the supermarkets are coming from in terms of how they're pushing their prices up and what the prices of individual foods are, I think can be very successful. 
Jack, will it work? I doubt it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a nice idea to bring in some expert advice, but as has been said, you know, I'm struggling to reel off a list of when these things have actually delivered great policies that we've all enjoyed at the end of it. Um, and, you know, I, I accept Kate Bingham was a terrific appointment and clearly was a, a massive thing for this country. Doesn't necessarily mean a venture capitalist is right for this role. Mm. And the optics of it, when people are, I mean, just eat, is kind of what people are just struggling to do at the moment. It, it's, it's not the idea that... that this guy's got some experience of what everyday households are going through is clearly not the case, and it, they might be wise to think about bringing in some expertise on that front as well. Well, no, but I do think that he has experience of what the businesses are trying to do. Sure. Businesses are not trying to squeeze customers at this point. A lot of the supermarkets, for example, they've come out and they've said, you know what, we're going to keep the prices on our value range stable or as stable as we possibly can. And I think having someone who can bridge that gap can be a good intermediary. I'm not saying it's very easy to say we're going to have a cost of living SAR and that's going to fix the whole problem. I'm not saying that, but I do think having someone who can bridge that gap between businesses and the really struggling consumers can be very helpful. I well, hope so. Well, we may find out about uh, the remit that he is going to have um, and wait for the recommendations. Uh, let's talk about uh, Rwanda because the first flight taking asylum seekers there is due to take off this evening. Now, it comes after the Court of Appeal rejected a legal challenge to the flight yesterday. Let's take a look at the front page of the Daily Mail. Their headline, the Court of Common Sense. Uh, to their credit, judges have three times rejected what the paper calls left-wing activists' demands to ground migrant flight. So what a farce. Only a handful out of 130 are still on the passenger list. Now, at the moment, we understand that only around seven or eight people are due to be on that flight uh, this evening because individuals are bringing their own legal cases. We'll keep an eye on that number. This is the Eyes front page. Same story, different angle. Church versus Boris Johnson. Bishops tell Prime Minister Rwanda flight shames the UK. Now, this is reporting that the Archbishops of Canterbury and York and all of the other 23 bishops in the House of Lords have said the policy is immoral. And we'll talk about that a little later on. Let's first of all hear from the BBC's Deputy Africa editor, Anne Soy. She's in Kigali, Rwanda's capital city. The government says it is ready to welcome the asylum seekers. As soon as the plane lands here, they will be handed over uh, to the Rwandan government they assume, the government assumes full responsibility for them. Uh, they will be taken to a hostel uh, here in Kigali. We have been uh, there uh, to see the facility. It is now ready. It was undergoing renovation. It's looking all new now. The beds are made. Uh, it will have shared bathroom facilities. And however, um, I have just been speaking to uh, the, one of the opposition leaders, Victoire Ngabire, and her concern is this is a facility that was hosting uh, orphans of the 1994 genocide and they were moved out of that facility, she said, uh, to give room uh, to the asylum seekers and that is her biggest concern. Uh, but beyond that, there hasn't been much of, a, of criticism here. Uh, out in the streets, uh, speaking to people, they say this is a nation of migrants. Many people have been refugees at some point in their lives because of the country's history and so they say they welcome the asylum seekers. And Soy reporting that from Kigali. Will this policy work, Tom? Will it lead to significantly fewer asylum seekers making that dangerous journey across the English Channel in small boats? I think for it to work, we do need to see um, some significant numbers over time going to Rwanda. And I think if that does happen, I think there needs to be a reasonable chance in the minds of those individuals attempting this dangerous journey that they could end up in Rwanda. And I think if that is the case, I think it will actually provide a deterrent. Uh, I think there'll be, it's going to be very attritional, uh, but I think that time will tell, but I'm hopeful it can be a success. Manira? Uh, no, I don't think uh, it's workable, and I think it's extremely expensive, as well as, uh, as being an immoral policy. We have a proud heritage as a country of welcoming uh, those seeking refuge here. What we do need to be doing is focusing on safe and legal routes uh, to, in order to deter the traffickers. And actually, it was the former Tory Prime Minister, Theresa May, who got up in the House of Commons herself and said, actually, you're more likely to encourage the traffickers to bring women and children over here because of this mm. policy. So I would suggest it isn't workable. And, it, and everything we've seen Priti Patel do so far on this issue has not worked and I have no confidence that this would have any any impact as well as being utterly immoral and far too expensive. £1.4 billion a year, is that good value for money in your, in your eyes, Tom? Well, I mean, what's the financial cost of having a never-ending situation 
where we have tens of thousands of people potentially ending up here illegally every year and the pressure that puts on our public services. I would also point out the majority of the public do support this policy in multiple, po multiple polls and I'd also say many of the most vocal critics have been from elite society and frankly have never had to live with the consequences of uncontrolled who, illegal immigration. Elite society? Who are you talking about? Well I think I've, for example some of those bishops who have um, intervened into the debate. Really? Are you saying it's the preserve of elites to criticise? Uh, well, has been to no, criticise this policy I, I think, or I, I the lawyers who are I think it's quite clear that some of the most vocal critics of this who have been the most hysterical over this policy have been individuals who have never had to live with the consequences of uncontrolled immigration and the impact that has on public services. They've never had to wait for a GP appointment. They've never had to battle to get a school place for their child. They've never had to f face a battle to get a council house. So I do find it a bit rich to be hearing lectures from them. Uh, uh, Tom, I think we've seen from the British public with the Homes for Ukraine scheme just how generous and big-hearted the British public are when thousands upon thousands of people have come forward uh, to, offer up, to, to, no, to offer up Don't their complain. home. So I think people are big-hearted and we should be looking it's at... Some, uh, uh, and, and, and they want to see similar sorts of things happen for different. Afghan refugees different. and we know that Afghans different. who are being slaughtered by the Taliban... I got a letter just two days ago about a 17-year-old girl... They're coming from France. Uh, no, 17-year-old girl who has yeah. been slaughtered by the Taliban uh, just last week. Her relative was my constituent, was desperate to bring her over, but the Home Office has not put safe and legal routes in place for those... Afghan refugees and we know that some of those Afghan refugees are ending up in those illegal boats. And what is the Liberal Democrats solution to stopping these crossings over the English Channel? Well, I've said we need some safe and legal routes. Well, we know there are some. There here. may not be yeah. enough, but there, but there are to, some. There need to be more. And we've said that we should uh, allow, uh, aside from uh, special schemes for special circumstances like Af Afghanistan but and Ukraine and Syria, that we should allow 10,000 refugees and 10,000 unaccompanied uh, asylum seekers uh, seeking children a year to be able to come to this country. We have a proud history. <laughs> we are a wealthy country. And, yes, I agree with Tom. We need to make sure the infrastructure is in place. Um, uh, around uh, GP surgeries, schools, etc. And GPs is something that we have been pushing very hard on because this government, again, has promised us thousands more new GPs and they're yet to materialise. Uh, a, couple, a couple of quick points directly to um, uh, Manira, if that's OK. Firstly, um, we're, we're dealing with individuals who are coming from France, which is, of course, a safe European country. That's where we are presently. In terms of safe legal routes, hypothetically, if there, if there was the option of applying for asylum in the UK from France, which of course is a safe country, and they were unsuccessful in that yeah. bid, and they, they still decided to come here illegally via small base, what would you do with them then? Well, I think if somebody has been processed by our asylum process... Uh, and unsuccessful, uh, who, uh, but still and unsuccessful then they have no right to stay here. So what do you do? Then, they, then, then Where would presumably they, go? they would have to go back to wherever they've come Miranda, from. Miranda, maybe. Well, I, I, what we're saying is we don't want... In this policy, you're not just shipping unsuccessful asylum seekers to Rwanda. You have suggested that somebody who successfully applies for asylum in Rwanda still has to stay there. So you're just basically, you know, offshoring... Do you think Rwanda's not have. safe? Do you think Rwanda's not safe? Well, <laughs> it was a UK government, FCDO, last year, uh, said to the UN that they had concerns about the, human the, rights the, in the, Rwanda. The, the UN who have sent refugees to Rwanda? Uh, and uh, Israel, who tried it, found it counterproductive and actually found that uh, tra trafficking went up and there was... Did the UN make a mistake to send refugees to Rwanda then? I'm not aware of the UN sending refugees well, to Rwanda. Can I just ask on the, on the Rwanda issue, though, Tom? I mean, are you sure that large numbers of asylum seekers will decide not to make the crossing because they fear being sent to Rwanda? After all, you and the government keep insisting that Rwanda is a very safe country. Maybe they will just make that crossing and go there. Well, uh, the key point here is about, you know, these individuals are in France, which is a safe... And France is a safe uh, European country where they, they could claim as, um, asylum status there. They've decided not to We're do We're an that. island. How and do you expect people to me, get here from other countries me, without crossing for me, other countries? The key, the key thing is this is about looking after individuals who are fleeing persecution and war zones. Um, so they will be safe in Rwanda, but that's where we get to the heart of the issue. For, for some of these people from France, this is actually their economic migrants. And this is what it's about. But you know that the vast majority of people who have made that crossing have been successful with their applications. I mean, I think it's something in the region of 70 or 
But what I don't quite understand is, for me, my understanding was you claimed asylum in the first safe country you were in. But and we're and an these island. individuals aren't doing that. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're an, an island. island. We're, we're so, a small so, so island. We, we can't have a situation where we have a precedent in numbers. The conclusion of what you're it. saying is, therefore, we shouldn't have any asylum seekers here at all. But that is not what I'm but saying. Because you have at all. to cross safe, safe is not what countries I've said at all. to be able to access the UK. That isn't what I'm saying. And actually, sometimes it's because the traffickers are being smuggled to the UK. All right, well, let's bring our other guests in. I mean, listening to this, and we have heard these arguments time and time again. On the policy itself, do you think it is going to work? The government is absolutely determined to press ahead, despite all the criticism and despite the fact that there may only be a handful of people on this first flight. So I think that's really what's at issue here. And it's been kind of characterised as, you know, should people stay in France? Should be... the, the point is, is that it's a very expensive policy. There's a lot of questions surrounding it. And there's not a huge amount of evidence, if any really that it's going to actually act as a deterrent um, well <laughs> you may say that but it, there was the home office officials couldn't come up with enough evidence which is why it had to be pushed through by ministerial direction politically opposed to it for our own reasons or they couldn't find any evidence and but also it works in Australia it Yes, it worked in Australia. The reason Different it worked in, Australia. in well, the reason it worked in Australia is because the crossing was about 200 miles across the Indian Ocean from Indonesia to Australia. But it, That's the crossing that but there are unprecedented refugees. Numbers. There are unprecedented. There are thousands of them successfully reaching Australia. Yes. Before, before. But also, they went also, down also, that also thousands of dying. And the reason it well, works... Well, exactly. That's why we need to stop this dangerous I, crossing I, from France. Yes, of course. And no one, is, no one is supporting the fact that we should have people dying at sea. No one is supporting that. But what I'm saying is that the sheer distance that refugees had to traverse across the Indian Ocean meant that the risk was so much greater. Whereas the 20-mile crossing across the Channel, I suspect a lot of people and a lot of women and children will still continue to make that crossing because they will take the gamble. But I would all, I'd say the English Channel is not as, not as, is not as long with the journey, but it's one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. Sure. You know, so, you know, it comes with its own dangers because of that. Mm. So I don't think that's completely fair. Can I pick up on the politics with you, um, Jack? How big an issue is this for the government? They're making it <laughs> certainly a, a big issue, a totemic issue, really, certainly for, for, for Pretty Patel. Uh, but just give us the sort of context to it. Well, they want to make it a big issue and they're enjoying the fight with the lawyers mm. and, and they're enjoying the headlines and they're enjoying the fact everyone's talking about it. Um, uh, it plays very well to a certain portion of the public. It, it's not true to say that it's hugely supported. It's absolutely down the middle if you look at the polling. It is, it is very supported by some people. This is very not supported by other people as we're witnessing playing out here today. The public are divided on this, but um, Boris Johnson knows and a good section of the Conservative Party knows that it plays very well to some people. And they also, they want to be seen to be doing something about this problem. And, and I think everybody agrees that something needs to be done. That, of course, doesn't mean that this needs to be done, and I'm not going to sit here with a different policy sol solution for you, but um, they're enjoying the way it's playing out in the media right now, and I think the fact that they're having these legal battles and potentially winning them um, plays perfectly in terms of how it looks to the country. They're fighting for this policy, uh, to pushing to get it through, and even if we have this slightly farcical situation where we spend all this money on a plane with nobody on it, they don't seem to care. I mean, will you give the policy a chance? If it does seem or it does prove to act as some sort of deterrent, would you back it? I, I, I just... I think it's immoral to try and ship uh, to another country people who've come here who are fleeing persecution, war and terrible circumstances. We have a responsibility. We process them here. If they don't have a right to stay, they go back. And if they do have a right to stay, we've seen over, uh, over decades, you, you think of the Ugandan refugees that we so proudly mm. welcome to this country. You know, they have done so well in our politics, in business. They have contributed so much to our country. And we need to embrace the fact that actually these people are not just a drain on our uh, resources, but actually they will enrich our country in the long term. How many asylum seekers would the Liberal Democrats take in government? Would you have any limit? Um, I mean, the, the, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, uh, he, of course, is talking about anybody who might want to claim asylum here in sort of tens of millions. Would you put any limit on that? So we've said at the moment that we should uh, allow about 10,000 uh, refugees and 10,000 unaccompanied asylum-seeking children uh, in, in a year to be able to come to this country, but that would be aside from special schemes like the Ukraine 
Ukrainian scheme, like the Afghan scheme, uh, or indeed Hong Kong. Um, and, uh, but that, that, that's what well, we've called... Well, there's Manir has put be, numbers on it and been be, honest about it. Be, be, well, there isn't uh, a number on the Ukrainian scheme because it's uncapped, rightly. Yes, it, and, and but that's because and, that's and actually, be I'm, I'm, actually, I see no contradiction. And, and me, me and my office, I would say, have worked extremely hard um, to try and support constituents who are looking to home refugees from Ukraine. And, and we've worked hard and we've had some success, actually, in, in, in making that happen. I see no contradiction between me holding that position and me saying what I've said here today with regards to the small boat crossings from France. I think, I think we want to show compassion, but we've got to have the ability to do so. And for me, I think a lot of these individuals who are coming over from France, who I must add are overwhelmingly young men, are actually making it harder for us to be generous towards the most genuine of refugees who are coming here directly from war-torn countries and fleeing persecution, not France. Uh, just before we move on, um, you say that the government's enjoying the fight over this. Um, is that how you would characterise the government's policy and legislation to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol, which, of course, critics have said will breach international treaties and law? To a degree. I think they're probably enjoying that one less. Mm. Um, it feels a bit more like it have more se might have more serious repercussions for them and indeed for all of us if it plays out really badly over the next uh, months and, and couple of years. There's definitely an element within Downing Street that thinks coming out swinging on Brexit and having big fights with Brussels plays well politically for the government in certain quarters, but I don't think that's a universal view. There are others who, others who think this is really serious and and that it shouldn't be something that's used for politicking and that solving this problem in a more, um, you know, a more normalised way where you're not just threatening to break laws and, and having massive scraps all the time would be a better approach. So I think that there's two views. We're going to talk more about that uh, on tomorrow's programme with Prime Minister's questions. Now, Nicola Sturgeon, Scotland's First Minister, is to launch uh, the Scottish independence campaign and obviously she wants to hold a second independence referendum. She's been talking this morning. Let's have a listen. I was re-elected as First Minister just over one year ago on a clear commitment to give the people of Scotland the choice of becoming an independent country. And the people of Scotland elected a Scottish Parliament with a decisive majority in favour of both independence and the right to choose. The Scottish Parliament, therefore, has an indisputable democratic mandate and we intend to honour that. Let's talk to BBC correspondent Glenn Campbell. Um, hello to you, Glenn. What's the significance of today's announcement? Well, Nicola Sturgeon says it's the start of a campaign for independence and for another referendum. What she's done today is to publish a document, the first in a series of papers, making the case for independence and dealing with some of the challenges that it would bring. And basically, today's paper... Uh, sets the UK against uh, 10 small European countries that perform better than it does economically and by certain other measures. And Nicola Sturgeon is inviting voters to imagine that Scotland could do much better if it were to choose independence. So our emphasis is on why she thinks Scotland should become independent, but our big challenge is the how. How does she bring about a, a referendum and achieve a yes vote? That is far from clear and far from certain. Are we going to get any more detail about that and also persuading more voters to back yes in any second independence referendum? She did sort of allude to that when she gave her speech this morning. Yeah, I mean, public opinion on independence is divided. It is sometimes uh, a bit uh, ahead for the yes side, although the current trend has the no side in front. But to summarise, it's pretty much split down the middle. Um, in terms of how that referendum happens, well, the way uh, it happened last time was by agreement. And to be honest, that's the only way to have a successful <laughs> referendum campaign. But the UK government is unlikely uh, to support a referendum by the end of next year, which is the timetable that Nicola Sturgeon has set. So what's her alternative? Well, she could introduce a referendum bill to Holyrood and face a legal challenge in the UK Supreme Court, make her arguments there. Then it would be for judges to decide whether Holyrood had the power to go ahead 
or not. That is a tricky path for her to take. She hasn't committed to that today. She says she will set out her procedural plans to Parliament probably before the end of this month. All right, Glenn Campbell in Edinburgh, thank you very much for joining us today. Let's talk about this headline in the Daily Mirror. Boris Johnson's food expert hits out at PM for ditching new wave of free school meals. Henry Dimbleby said it was impossible to claim kids on universal credit don't all need free school meals, as he warned the cost of living crisis is sit hitting some of Britain's poorest families hard. Was the government right to shelve the recommendation to expand free school meals, Tom? Um, I'd say it was, it was quite a, a wide-ranging report, that, and actually much mm. of it the government um, will adopt and, and, and support. In terms of that particular, mm. you know, I think we, we've got a situation now where, we're, you know, touch wood, it's post-pandemic, and I think we have to have a bit of a debate about you know, how how far we want eligibility to go for free school meals. I think, and I think it's you know the government are actually keeping that under review. They're just saying that right now they're not in a, they don't feel like they're in a position to commit to that particular recommendation. You know, there is an issue about cost here, mm. and there are some other issues at play as well. I have to say, it's it's quite. You, I've been on the show enough to know <laughs> for you to know that I rarely sit on the fence. On this one, um, you know, I'm kind of all ears. I, I think there's a bit of a debate to be had about it. I'm pleased to so go. You could be persuaded yeah. by this because there will be people who say, uh, Tom, uh, it could be a really easy and direct way of helping people deal with the cost of living crisis. Yeah, but there's lots of different interventions. I, I agree. Make. But I, I think this is one that should be considered. And, 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 you know, and I have spoken to some um, teachers in my constituency who have said that you know, something like this could be a good thing, right? So I, I think there's lots of different steps that we can take to help with cost of living, in addition to some of the steps you've already taken. Uh, uh, but uh, but I, uh, I think it's, you know, it should be considered. What do you think? I think we need to get Marcus Rashford on the case, personally. Um, I, I, I'm aghast that this recommendation hasn't been accepted by the government. Because, because as Tom said, there are choices to be made post-pandemic with the cost of living. Are you expecting there the government the, to pay for everything? No, the cost of living crisis is really biting right now. In the first quarter of this year alone, we saw uh, the number of families living with food insecurity go up by several percent. About six million children we know are going hungry. Uh, so the, the fact that uh, many people on universal credit, their children aren't eligible for free school meals, I, I find astonishing when we know that families are struggling to put meals on the table. In terms of children's progress, in terms of their health, in terms of their concentration, it's been shown that having, you know, a good, balanced uh, nutritional diet is really important and that hot meal once a day is absolutely critical. And this seems like a really missed opportunity uh, for the government to step in. And Tom's saying, oh, well, they'll keep it under review. Families need this help right now. Our children are going hungry right now. Has Manira persuaded you? Um, well, she, you know, she's, made, she's, made some, she's made her case. Um, what, what, I'd, what I'd say is that, you know, I was, I was pleased to, to hear the announcement about, the, you know, the 20-odd billion pounds of additional support with people's energy bills. I'm very concerned about fuel prices at the moment, very concerned about how those have gone up. The 5p cut seems to have been swallowed up within a matter of weeks. Well, would you, you, know, like, the, would you like the government to do so, more on so that? Look, I, I, I think, you know, it's right the government are it's... open to taking further steps. It's just... It's just about how we best help people, right? You know, do we do, do we do, 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 do we do something further on fuel duty, further on energy bills, or, or do we think actually the best way is, is through extending the eligibility for free school meals? You know, that is the debate. That, that, but, but it does all cost significant amounts of money. Mm. Um, but ultimately, the government will have to make that call. Can I just say, in last year's budget, we saw the Chancellor. Um, uh, scrap the surcharge on, on bankers, which costs about £3.8 billion over uh, several years. Increasing the eligibility for those on universal credit would be somewhere around seven, between £700 and £800 million. But, frankly, I think most of the public would rather be putting food in hungry children's bellies than helping you know, investment bankers dine out at the top restaurants. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Sh I'm not quite sure about that. That comparison. But no, I think that there is a there's a debate to be had about whether, and it's being kept under review. Um, like lots of things are being kept under review. The government has done, I think, quite a lot to help people with cost of living. I think it's it could well do more, uh, and this may well be something which it, which it considers when it's thinking about what it does. To help. Uh, and the government would say 37 billion pounds worth of help in various guises has been put on the table for families and households, but. We all remember Marcus Rashford's campaign to offer food vouchers to children over the school holidays, for example, in 2020. You could say the government's got form when it comes to this sort of issue. It's £544 million. That would give an additional 1.1 million children a free lunch. Worthwhile? Well, look, I think, I think Tom's right to say that he would 
stay on the fence on this because actually it can be a very helpful policy and I think we do have to think about the best way to help families in the most targeted way. Um, I think the government should be very wary of digging their heels in on this on this issue because as we've seen they're quite known to do a couple of U-turns on free school meals but because they don't that there, there is no economic policy, plan for growth, plan for taxes that they can turn to and say, actually, this is how we're going to push forward economic policy. They get bogged down in these issues over free school meals, over, you know, individual fights. Jack? It's hard to think of something more worthwhile you could spend the money on than hungry children, though, isn't it? I mean, even money on fuel bills, you know, the, the families that get this can spend the money they've saved on their fuel bills if they want to, but surely no one's saying these kids should go hungry. To me, it's just really tinnered politics again. Mm. They've made this mistake twice already and been made to look really stupid about it and then been dragged into doing the policy anyway, because <laughs> if you poll this sort of stuff, you know what the public are going to say, and I can understand why Tom is wanting not to come out too strong, because I'm sure your constituents, I, I, if you ask them, think we should I, feed I think, these kids... I, I think, I think right now, if you polled any any measure that would provide further support for people through a very challenging time, it would probably score quite... Um, I'm, I'm, it would probably be quite popular in polling. That, that, but, but ultimately, sure the government has got to balance all of that with, with the, the, the overall picture. Yeah, but if, if you're going, to, if you're going to provide more support, which you're obviously suggesting they might do, it's hard to see one that people would agree with more than something like this. And, and there are options. So Henry Dimbleby recommended the universal mm. credit mm. um, for those on universal credit to get free school meals. The 544 million you referred to, Joe, was actually for a less generous proposal. So he said, well, this is your backup option uh, to extend the eligibility, but not for everybody who's on universal credit. But even that's been battered back. And... Uh, Furthermore, we know that infant free school meals that are that are available to all infants, thanks to Liberal Democrats in government, it was a coalition policy, since they were introduced in 2014, the funding for that has only gone up by four pence, Tom, four pence. And we know that food inflation is through the roof and, and there is a concern now that either portion sizes, uh, sizes yes. will be cut or other parents who are paying for their meals are going to have to pay more I, just when I think the cost of living I think crisis I think there's, I think there's a, is at a crunch point. I think there's a point here. You know, as I say, I'm not, I'm not you know, I, uninfluenced by some of the arguments that have been made here. Um, but I'd say that if we do extend the eligi eligibility criteria to, the, to everyone who's in receipt of universal credit, that, that would be a permanent change. It would be a permanent change. It wouldn't just be a short-term targeted cost of living measure. So I guess that's probably the slight difference between some of the other things we've been talking about and this measure. Not necessarily saying that isn't the right thing to do, but I'm just saying I wanted to make... Uh, it is slightly different. Is there a philosophical debate now to be had about the level of state support generally across the board in the sort of post-pandemic cost of living crisis? Um, this, I mean, we're saying here now... Tom is saying that this would be perhaps a permanent measure that would come in. I mean, during a debate on free school meals in 2020, admittedly a few years ago, um, Sally Ann Hart, Conservative MP, said we cannot have a culture that encourages the government to take over the most basic roles of parenting. And we cannot have a culture where parents expect the government to feed their children so that they can have money for other things. Now, that may not stand in the situation we are in right now. But is there a point more broadly? I think I think there's definitely a philosophical debate to be had, especially after the pandemic, where there was, you know, huge levels of state intervention. But I would say that we we can't punish kids for that. I think kids deserve to be fed, and if their parents aren't able to put food on the table, they still deserve the right to a good education. They deserve to be able to have had enough food to not be thinking about how hungry they are. I think, I think that's right. You're trying to tell a teacher who's got hungry kids in the mm. class about a philosophical debate and they'll probably come and slap you one in the chops, <laughs> won't they? I think the other thing we should say as well, that this intake of kids have had such a yeah, rough time. Absolutely. The pandemic. They've 100%. been kept, you know, they've missed out on so much stuff. They're so far behind in so many ways. Like, here's something you could do to at least make sure they're going into class every day with a, a full belly and trying to, trying to catch up. Well, at the end of the discussion, are you persuaded? Will you go back to the government and say, look again? I'm still getting splinters on the fence. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still. Yeah, I'm all ears, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm I'm sympathetic to some of the arguments that have been made. All right. Um, let's talk about residents of Whitby on the east coast of Yorkshire who have voted to ban future new build properties in the town from becoming second homes. Uh, we can show you a headline in the mail. More than 2,000 people voted in favour of the ban, with just 157 opposing it. The turnout was 23%. It's not binding on the local council, but could help to shape planning considerations. Uh, property prices have gone up sharply in the past year. 
year. Let's talk to Asa Jones, 21-year-old charity worker who can't afford to rent or buy in Whitby, where he grew up. Hello to you. How difficult is it for you, or would it be for you, to get onto the housing ladder in your hometown, let alone rent? Well, you know, Whitby's, I don't know if anyone on the panel today has ever been to Whitby, but it's such a popular place. You know, we've got Bram Stoker's Dracula, we've got Captain Cook, everyone wants to come here. And that gets reflected in the housing markets. I mean, prices, Whitby looks affluent when you come here and you visit, but it's got a really big working class community. But our house prices are like it's the home counties, or dare I say even London. So you have a situation where you try and, I mean, I... For me, myself, I don't even bother looking at houses. For me, that's beyond it because you, you try and buy a house and you get outbid by someone who can easily spend a million quid on their first home and think, hey, what's, you know, a couple of hundred, couple of other hundred thousand on a second home in a quaint little seaside village in the north. So for me, it's renting. And that's where the second homes problem really comes in because everyone who has a property who could rent looks at it and says, well, I could do that. Or I could turn it into a TripAdvisor, or, uh, not TripAdvisor, what am I thinking? Airbnb or a holiday <laughs> let and make about twice as much money. So it's, it, I'm, I'm stuck at home. I'm with my parents, myself, and I know pretty much everyone I know is very similar at my age. And it's probably not going to change, is it, anytime soon, that situation? No, I'm not holding out hope for that to change. Whitby's not going to become less popular. It's not going to become cheaper. It's, mm. not, it's not going to be any of those things. What about the vote itself? Do you think it'll change things? Well, the vote for me, my involvement with getting this vote held was always on the basis of getting a strong democratic mandate behind the idea because we have a local council in Scarborough and things are complicated because our local government's getting reorganised recent uh, in the next year or so. Um, and it's pure geography. All of, most of the councillors at our local council are from Scarborough, so there isn't as great an understanding of the needs of our town as there could be. That's just the way it is. So this issue has been brought to the council a few months ago and my feeling was, let's have, a, let's have a referendum, a town poll, and let's mm. say, as a town, this is what we want. Were you disappointed then that, that fewer than a fifth of people turned out to vote? Isn't there apathy it, over this then? I tell you, there's apathy in Whitby for every vote. You don't get <laughs> higher than 30%, <laughs> well, maybe at general election. It, it's not that kind of town that comes out. Um, it wasn't as good, obviously. You know, in politics, it's either everything's really good or everything's really rubbish. There's no nuance, and I think this is a nuanced result. It's a great result, particularly considering that polling stations were open between four and nine, not, what is it, seven o'clock and then ten. Mm. And there was a much shorter campaign. There was oh, The only publicity was what our group and the groups we've been working with could get, you know, uh, build up around it. There was very, very little awareness. And we had people turning up at one of the polling stations at nine o'clock saying, oh, we didn't know it was on. We really want to vote. Have we found the right place? And there was confusion about polling stations. To get... 22% when the local elections in May, we got, was it 28%, I think, mm. for the town. It's pretty good, all, right. all considering. All right, Asa, stay with us while we um, talk to the panel. Perhaps we can show some pictures of beautiful Whitby. Um, Jack, <laughs> uh, what is your view about holding this sort of, sort of referendum? Is it localism in action or not really worth it if it's not going to be binding? I think it's terrific. I mean, it, it, this is exactly what you want to see, local communities having the chance to speak with the voice on issues that really match them. How much debate do you hear down in this place about the issue of second homes? Answer, nowhere near enough, you know. It's not something that people are all worried about. In fact, how many MPs have got second homes? Probably loads of them, mm. you know. But if you go into these towns and villages, I used to work for the Yorkshire Post. I've spent lots of time in Whitby and plenty of other villages in York North Yorkshire that have huge problems with second homes. It's a massive issue for them, you know. Young people being forced to move away. And it's not just that. Some of these towns... People don't live in them anymore because it's all just people and turning so they're up empty, at the aren't weekend. They? So the mm. pubs close, the local shop, I mean, smaller places than Whitby, but pop shops close, people just turn up with the supermarket shop in the car and then they, they disappear again. Would you support this sort of thing? More local referenda? I yeah. mean, in your county of Suffolk, I'm sure there are plenty of second uh, homes there yeah, too yeah, yeah, on yeah. the coast. Would you go as far as calling for a ban? Look, I mean... I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily commit to that now, but I, I would say that, you know, I've been a councillor before I was an MP and I have been very involved in supporting things like community land trusts that have all been about allowing young people within, uh, you know, within villages, etc., to be able to afford to, st to, to live in those villages. And I think the danger is a lot of these, what are, were strong communities, become, become sort of ossified over time as a lot of the people who perform key functions that make those communities tick cannot afford to live there right. and, and have to move somewhere else. But how and, do you make it happen? Well, I think community land trust is one, one way which has been successful of allowing people to, 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 to 
um, pay your rent affordably within those communities, and they're kept um, owned by the trust in perpetuity. You know, I saw that work in East Anglia. You know, uh, so yes, in principle, I am. You know, I've always had a bit of a communitarian streak. You know, and I, and I, and I wouldn't have any massive objections to this. <laughs> uh, Jack says people down here haven't been talking about it. Actually, my colleague Tim Farron has been leading a campaign on this, both in Parliament and he's been uh, in the media quite a lot because obviously he, he represents the Lake District. Uh, huge problem and what's there. What's the campaign? Uh, well, he, he's arguing for uh, a change in planning classes so that if you want to buy, if you want to convert your home or property you've bought into either a second home or, or a holiday let, that, that you have to apply for plan planning permission to do that. And that then brings in the local control at a local council level where, uh, where local authorities that have got I, understand the needs of their I community I think there's, there's, can, there's can actually involved. a point here, you know, and I've, I've seen villages that have been, had a history of being pretty hostile to any kind of new housing actually become much more supportive of new housing when they can see how the community can directly benefit from that housing, whether it's for rent or to buy. You know, and, and, and you know, if you design new housing, which is in keeping with the character of an area, um, put some money into some community facilities and, and actually get young local people getting an opportunity to pay rent affordably and get on a property ladder, I think that's a good thing. Do you think this sort of thing will work? referendums, trying to get local action, persuade and perhaps even compel local authorities to take action to protect uh, new builds for local residents? I mean, I think it's a fantastic thing that locals are actually getting really involved in their communities. I think it means that they end up much more engaged in democracy and they've become much more engaged when they can see it actually working. Um, and I do think towns and villages know better what is going to help the culture of their individual, because it's their home, it really matters to them. And that's why when we talk about housing, it's so important because the culture of where they live matters. I do think there should be more power within local communities, but it does have to come with a national plan for how we deal with housing. Because otherwise you end up with these small little pockets where some people can afford to have a home because they have a strong community spirit and others where people can't. I mean, the problem is, um, has been posed actually by the local MP there, is that a lot of people would just block new houses being built at all. Never mind who's the... Isn't supply just the key to all of this? Yeah, absolutely, supply is. And for, for once, I agree with Tom that we need to give local communities more... Uh, you know, we need to empower them more and involve them in the conversation, which is why sort of top-down government uh, targets by algorithm on, on how many houses should be built is just the wrong way to go, that actually local communities and local authorities know uh, and understand the needs and also, you know, know what, 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 what land and buildings are available. And so I I, think... I'm actually running a campaign, which I think Michael Gove is now going to support, mm. to say that when we're selling public sector buildings um, that, that they, sh uh, they should be able to be sold below market value so that we can convert them into social and affordable housing. I'm, I'm fighting a battle with the Mayor of London in my own constituency over a police station that's being sold at the moment on that issue. I think, look, I think if house building and growth is seen um, by communities that it's something that is done to them, not with them, that they're fundamentally part of. You know, but you, you can actually, and I've seen it, villages that were anti-growth become pro-growth when they've got a stake in it. And they, feel, and they feel like they're shaping it. You know, so I, yeah, we do need to build more homes. Desperately, we do. Right. Desperately, we do. But we need to do so in a way that enhances communities, doesn't run against a grain of them. Asa, before the end of the programme, um, what do you make of what you've heard? I think they're absolutely right about the effects that it's having in our community because people do move out. There's a town north of us called Loftus that's become very popular. The prices are rising there because it's so popular as a place for people to get out. But people often don't choose to commute back in. They choose to work elsewhere. And we've got a massive elderly population in our town. So we've got a massive social care industry, but there's no one to run it. And it's, it's slowly collapsing, just as it is everywhere in the country, I appreciate. But it is collapsing here. I, I think... I know you've got a, a Liberal Democrat on the uh, on the panel there. I'm no fan of Tim Farron, but on the issue of housing, he is bang on right, OK? This, the changing of use cases uh, in planning law to make sure that we can have a separate, um, I don't really, category for second homes and yes. holiday homes would be exactly the right. right thing. All right. I'm going to have to stop you there, Asa Jones, but thank you very much for joining us there from Whitby. That's all we have time for on today's programme. Thank you to all of my guests for joining me today. I'll be back tomorrow for PMQs at 11.15. From all of us here, have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye.